had a torn rib cage muscle. You know how painful that can be. So he wanted very much to play as much as possible at the end of the season. That's why he is in there. 22 homers, 64 runs batted in for Glenn Davis, a 252 average. By the way, Biggio, who came in batting 274, leads the team with that average. That is the lowest club leading average in baseball. That's the kind of uh, year the Astros have had at the plate. And it's not coincidental that they are last in the National League in batting. Inside corner for a called strike, and it's no balls and two strikes. Davis with a couple of runs batted in last night. Each of the first two games of the series won by Cincinnati by a run. They won on Monday four to three and last night three to two. And Houston's league lowest batting average of 247 or make the 242 is a whole seven points lower than Montreal which is next. Rattling the cage of catcher Joe Oliver. Count remains no balls two strikes base runner aboard is Biggio we got a two out single here in the top of the first inning the Cincinnati Reds gearing up for the Pittsburgh Pirates and that's a renewal of what was a great postseason rivalry back in the 70s. Those. Art Howe said many of the decisions for next year have been made at least mentally the problem is physically they don't know who's coming back and who's not. Filed away. Glenn Wilson is out with a knee injury. Will he come back? Mike Scott's shoulder a problem. He probably won't throw again until spring training. You mentioned Darwin, Smith, potential free agents. Stubbs, Gullickson probably won't be back. Augusto is a free agent. Glenn Wilson probably won't be back. I say probably because nobody's really <laughs> sure. Well, their pitching staff is fairly set. They have their four starters, Mark Portugal being the other pitcher that hasn't been mentioned. Davis hits it into right center field coming on to make the catches Winningham a hit a man left but no runs. We played half an inning here in Cincinnati. We'll meet the starters for the National League Western Division champion Reds in a minute. Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati is really buzzing. They're getting set. You see nobody really here this afternoon. Not a big crowd last night but wait until tomorrow night. Sears diehard starting lineup for the Western Division champion Reds Barry Larkin leading off and playing shortstop and it's Herm Winningham in center field today Paul O'Neill in right Eric Davis in left field playing for the first time in the past six games Al Morris at first base Luis Quinones at third Mariano Duncan a good year for him at second base and he'll have to play every day in the playoffs the catcher is Joe Oliver in batting ninth is the pitcher Danny Jackson and the Astros defensively will have Franklin Stubbs at left. Eric Yelding in center and Mark Davidson in right, a strong arm right fielder in Davidson. Tim Caminiti on the end, Bill at third. Andrew Harris Daniel, one of the great names in baseball at short. Casey Candell at second and Glenn Davidson at first and a battery of Craig Biggio behind the plate. And Randy Hennis making his first major league start on the mound. He's a big one, 6'6, 220, 24 years old from the University of California, Los Angeles. Hennis has appeared in a couple of games. But this is a big moment for this young man his first major league start and he does it final day of the season against the division champions. Well if you're going to make an impression this is the place to make it. Larkin pops the first pitch up right side and Davis is there in fair territory one away one pitch and one out. Larkin is set even if he goes 0 for 4 he will hit 300 and that was a big concern of Lou Pinella. And it's nice to have a manager that's concerned about things like that. I'm sure the players appreciate that kind of concern of course Lou being a hitter might be a little more uh, in tune to those types of concerns but as you said Larkin can go over four and not only is Larkin sitting but Barry Bonds in Pittsburgh also wants to keep his average over 300 he'd be one of the first guys to hit 30 homers steal 50 bases and drive in 100 runs and hit 300. Herm Winningham is in center field today but look to see a lot of Billy Hatcher in that spot. Once the league championship series begins, it'll begin in Cincinnati right here tomorrow night, 8:30, and then a 3:15 game on Friday. The weekend off, and then they go to Pittsburgh for three Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Skipping well, Thursday, back here Friday and Saturday if need be. It's a weird schedule, and some people aren't too happy with it. Well, they got to pay those big TV salaries that you make, John. So right, <laughs> three and one the count on Herm Winningham. This year at Tucson, Hennis was 10 and 8, the RA of 4.41. And last year at Columbus, he was 9 and 9. So he's been around a 500 pitcher in the minors. And a base on balls. 
Winningham is aboard. I think that's one of the concerns about Hennis in this situation is how his control would be. Well, actually, Hennis was sent home. He was only called up when Mike Scott was felled by shoulder stiffness in front and behind his throwing arm. So actually, this is a lucky break for Hennis if he can impress. He was all set to settle in and enjoy the offseason. Bouncing ball to second base. They get one there on the first. No. Goes into the dugout and down to second base on the play. We'll go Paul O'Neill. 4-6 on the force of Winningham. It'll be a fielder's choice and an error on the throw by the shortstop Sedeno. So the young man, a little anxious to turn two, and he threw it away. Of course, coming right at him was Winningham. Winningham got a good jump, and it took a while for Candell to get the ball over to Sedeno, but that's a pretty athletic move. It might not hurt to try to see what you can do in a situation like this late in the season, obviously. And it gets away from Davis, and sometimes it'll hit the screen and bounce back, but this one bounces into the Reds' dugout. And after missing five games in a row, the cleanup batter is Eric Davis. Davis saying after taking batting practice yesterday, felt a little stiff, but that was normal. Lou Pinella says he's 100%. You have to wonder <laughs> about that. Of course, he's the kind of guy, if he gets hot, he can certainly make the difference and carry a ball club. Well, they certainly have to have a guy like that in the lineup. He has been plagued by stiffness in his left shoulder, but he says he's played hurt all year. One of the concerns is that Eric has been hurt for most of his career, and at some point, either he's going to have to play through a little of the pain. Well, early in the season, back in April, it was a strained right knee. Forced some changes in his swing. He's worked hard at rehabilitation, but he still hears it now and then from the fans here in Riverfront Stadium. Well, if he can't play through the pain, they're going to be in trouble. Up high for a ball. Two and one the count. Two outs. The runner at second is O'Neill. Reached on a fielder's choice and went to second on a throwing error on an attempted double play. Davis hits it down the right field line. In fair territory, it's tracked down by Davidson. And after one, we are scoreless in Riverfront Stadium. Back with the top of the second. Reds getting set for the Pirates tomorrow. We are back in Riverfront Stadium set for the top of the second inning. As Bill Patrick mentioned at the start of the afternoon things are sewn up here in the National League but not so in the American League. There is more to be settled and it just might be settled tonight and ESPN will be there for all of that. Toronto and Baltimore coming up tonight on ESPN. That'll start at 730 and we'll of course keep you posted on Chicago and Boston as well. And if there is a playoff it will be tomorrow and it'll be right here on ESPN. Second inning Franklin Stubbs who is having a career season leads off. He's at 23 homers driven in 71 and hits the first pitch into left field for a base hit. So he's only 13 for his last 29. Pretty good stretch drive for a guy who's going to be a free agent and he's put together his most solid major league season and the important thing is timing you have to <laughs> you have to it's know when to have good, yeah, really you have to know when to have that good season and one of the things that Stubbs does well now is he goes to the opposite field well with those pitches away Ken Caminiti is the batter and Stubbs immediately is running the throw to second base is not in time Franklin Stubbs with his 19th stolen base of the year the Astros lead the National League with 130 stolen bases. Of course, the big problem has been trying to get him on base. And he gets a good jump, both feet in the pit. And for a big man, he runs well. Oliver had a pretty good throw, but Stubbs just got a good jump off Jackson, and he's in scoring position. And it looks like he's thinking about taking off for third, and he is. The ball is bounced to the right side. Doing his job to make sure Stubbs gets to third is Caminiti. He is out number one. Somebody possibly got their signals crossed. Stubbs had a good jump, but you can't fault Caminiti. He's just doing his job trying to move the runner over. They've had one run games the previous two, as John told you, so one run could make the difference. Mark Davidson is the batter. He had a couple of hits in the game on Monday. And Mark working on a modest little four game hitting streak. He's batting 440 in his last 25 times up. It's a ball and no strikes. Davidson is 29 years old. Came from the Twins in a deal in May of 89. 
A runner at third and one out here in the top of the second inning. Scoreless ball game, and it's fouled straight back. And Davidson with some playoff experience and World Series experience with the Twins. And a couple of guys on this team, Cincinnati as well as Pittsburgh, not a lot of playoff experience, but some. Fouled away, that'll be out of play down the right field line. You talked a lot to an old friend of yours, Mr. Mailer, who has some playoff experience for Cincinnati. He had it while with the Braves in 1982. Pitched a game. Danny Jackson has some playoff and World Series experience with the Royals in 85. Low and inside. It's three balls and two strikes on Mark Davidson. As you saw a moment ago, batting a little over 300 with runners in scoring position. The Astros trying to take the lead. Swing and a miss. Great location with that pitch, and there was nothing Davidson could do about it. Two outs, two strikeouts now for Danny Jackson. Looks like a hard slider, a cut fastball right in on the hands. And you can tell Davidson trying to bring his hands in to hit the inner part of the ball, but the ball has such movement that Mark's not able to get through the strike zone and make contact. Andujar Cedeno combined a couple of well-known Astro names. <laughs> Joaquin Andujar and Cesar Cedeno, no relation to either one. Stubbs is at third. There are now two outs in the inning. Jackson trying to keep Houston off the board here in the second inning. But Cedeno looking for his first major league hit. He's 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. He's only 21 years old. He's from the Dominican Republic. And again, Jackson works him inside. <laughs> You're not going to do much with the ball in that location, right off the hands. That's usually an emergency two strike swing. Oh, well, you know, we were talking to Lupinella about how long Danny might pitch today because he certainly had a plan last night using six different pitchers and using them for specific reasons and got a good performance. Swing and a miss. Jackson could go six, maybe seven. This is his normal spot in the rotation. They strand a runner at third. The bottom of the second is coming up from Cincinnati. Expressed consent of Major League Baseball. Leading off the bottom of the second is Hal Morris. Hal, 25 years old, came to the Yankees in December of last year. Had a great season in Nashville. And he batted 344. And he's done well up here. A 344 average. He's one of the Yankees that Lou Pinella brought with him, but they also have a couple of other former Yankees that have made contributions this year. Jose Rijo being probably the first and foremost, and also in the bullpen, Tim Leana, a former Yankee. He can swing the bat, and he hits that one toward right center field. Yelding is on the move, makes the catch over the shoulder. Eric Yelding, who has good speed, tracks it down in right center field. It's a long out for Hal Morris. One away in the second. Well, Hennis throws a fastball and a cut fastball over the top curve. This time he left that fastball high and Yelding with tremendous speed, whether he's in the infield or outfield, tracks it down. That'll bring up Luis Quinones. Quinones traded from the Cubs. To the Reds in April of 88. It's a called strike. Luis is batting 248. Down low pro ball. Had a career year last year coming off the bench as he does this year. Can play three infield positions, most often third and second. But he had 12 home runs last season. Matter of fact, he's played all four infield positions and started everywhere but first base so far this year. So he really does help you. The problem, of course, for Cincinnati is that they won't have Bill Doran. They got him on August the 31st, and it was announced today his back problems are going to result in surgery. He is out, and uh, the Reds have a couple of decisions to make as he grounds at the first base. Quinones is out number two. One of those is what they're going to do for a left handed bat because they made the decision Billy to go with 16 position players and nine pitchers for the playoffs. They're locked into that number and they thought that Dorn really gave them a lot of versatility. Now they've got a problem and you have to replace Dorn with somebody in your organization 
And the Reds really aren't that deep. They may have to go all the way down to double A to find a replacement. High in the air, right side. Not hit too well. Davidson moving in. And the Reds go quietly in inning number two. A scoreless two innings in Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati. We go to the third. Hitters nine, one, and two do up. Scoreless ball game as we begin the third inning. I'm John Sanders along with Billy Sample, and Riverfront Stadium will be decked out tomorrow as the Pirates come in to begin the 1990 National League Championship Series. And we mentioned a little bit about some of the decisions that Cincinnati has to make. Another one, Billy, deals with the pitching staff. Now we've talked about replacing Doran and Adam Casillas and Billy Bates are probably two likely candidates there as Randy Hennis leads off the inning. His first major league at bat and a swing and a miss. The other involves the pitching staff and who will be those nine pitchers. The starters are going to be Riho, Browning, and Jackson. Other spots, though, as it is grounded foul, we're pretty certain that Charlton, who's been moved back to the bullpen, will be there. Rick Mailer, Rob Dibble, and Randy Myers, of course, the closers. But the final two spots could be between three pitchers, Jack Armstrong, Tim Leana, who we may see today, and Scott Scudder. Well, Armstrong had that all-star first half as Hennis goes down on strikes, but he's actually the one that most likely doesn't pitch as well from the bullpen. And in this situation, if you got your three starters, you need somebody that can come in in middle relief and pitch from the pen. So Armstrong might be handicapped a little bit there where Scudder can pitch from the pen and Leana is a bullpen pitcher. Well he had two strong innings last night did Armstrong as Yelding hits the ball towards center field and it's a base hit. So Yelding aboard and now he'll have that chance if he wants to take a shot at it to tie the club record for stolen bases. He has 64. Lupinella did say that somebody's going to be disappointed because they're not all going to be available. He also said that Armstrong does not have the capability to come in during an inning. The only way you could use him is to start an inning. They chase Yelding back at first. And you don't think voting them a full share will appease the pitcher that's left off of those three? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you? No, I don't. <laughs> Everybody wants to play. You know, it was interesting sitting around watching ESPN last night. You know it's late in the season when Chris Berman comes on and does his version of Hotel California from Dodger Stadium but Rich Gedman was more than interested in what was happening in Boston last <laughs> night wasn't he. Well he'll at least know what they think of him because the remaining Red Sox players will vote on players who were called up who weren't there for the whole year and players who were traded and since Gedman was traded he'll find out just how well he was like because they could vote him anywhere from a hundred dollar grant to a full share. Well, he was traded in early June, the 7th of June. Snap throw to first, and Yelding goes back head first. One ball, one strike, one out, and one on. Scoreless ball game, top of the third in Riverfront Stadium. Matt Galante coaching down at third base, Ed Napoleon at first. Phil Garner was the first base coach early in the year. He's now the bench coach. I asked Phil if he liked it, and he said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I said, where are you going to be next year? He said, I don't know. But Phil Garner wrote an article for a Pittsburgh paper that's going to appear in Pittsburgh today for the press in Pittsburgh. And in it, he told me he picks the Pirates to beat the Reds. There are some more than interested parties that have been quoted in regards to the upcoming playoffs. Dave Parker, for example, has some opinions. Wait a minute, John. Now, who is he going to pick if he's writing for a Pittsburgh paper? That's a good point, Billy. Since he still has a lot of friends back in Pittsburgh. And a little bit of his heart is still in Pittsburgh. One and two to Casey Candell. He'll love to go back there and visit. Of course, he was part of that 79 team that swept the Reds and went on to win the World Series after being down three to one to Baltimore. That was 79. These are, as has been mentioned many times, the only two teams in the National League, Cincinnati and the Pirates, who will meet here tomorrow who didn't win division championships in the 80s. They played in the last one in the 70s and the first one in the 90s. 
And the only link between the 70s and the 90s is Tony Perez, the first base coach of the Reds. Yelding is going. The ball is lined into right a base hit. Yelding around second on his way to third. The throw comes through. Runners at the corners and one out. Houston had a runner at second and nobody out in the second inning couldn't score. Yelding and Candell with back to back hits and now runners at the corners. So Houston threatens again for the second straight inning against Danny Jackson. Your basic hit and run executed to a T. Candell brings his hands inside, inside outs the ball to right field. Yelding, of course, running on the pitch. Might have been the only way he would have gotten a third because O'Neill has a strong arm. Biggio had a base hit his first time up. A chance to give Houston the lead here in the third inning. This time Oliver changing his tune a little bit. The last time the Astros had a runner in scoring position, they came inside with the bottom of the order with hard sliders. He started Biggio outside. Now he's coming back inside. Butted foul. The matchups for the National League Championship Series that begins tomorrow. Riho against Walk in game one Browning and Drabic in game two in game three which will not be till next Monday it'll be Danny Jackson who's pitching today and Zane Smith for the Pirates Lou Pinella talking about the number of pitchers he needed for postseason play said well if we need ten pitchers we're in a whole lot of trouble <laughs> yeah I don't think you need really more than seven possibly eight in a short series you can get by with you're going to have some of your starters possibly pitching on three days rest but the Pirates are going to go with some right handers against the Reds because the Reds don't hit right handers as well as they hit left handers batting 280 against left handers while only hitting 258 against right handers runners at the corners here and it's low and away count evens at two and two and of course Bob Walk is a pitcher who's had quite a bit of success against Cincinnati and he's another guy with playoff experience he started game one of the 1980 World Series against the Royals while a member of the Phillies and he also pitched in the 1982 playoffs Cardinals versus Braves slap toward right a base hit the Astros break on top one nothing Biggio is two for two and he drives in a run three straight hits here in the third after the opening batter struck out and that has produced a one nothing lead for Houston you almost get the feeling that Biggio a catcher Understood the sequence. They started outside, tried to come back inside, and then go back outside again. He just stuck the bat out and just laid it where it was pitched. Lou Pinella also telling us that he felt his team was in much better shape today, right now, as they get set to start and host the National League Championship Series than they were, say, a couple of weeks ago. He said the pieces are fitting better now. But he's still a little discouraged about the offense. Interestingly enough you mentioned that those two teams the Pirates and the Reds were six and six on the year but each team won four in the opponent's ballpark Pirates won four here the Reds won four out of six in three rivers. A lot of people I think are predicting a seven game series. You just never know though what's going to happen when postseason comes around. You know, sometimes Billy guys who have great seasons come up empty in postseason. It's really hard to predict, but you spent many years covering the Pirates. How do you see the series? I see it pretty even. Um, I think the Cincinnati bullpen. I knew I couldn't paint you into a corner. No, well, one dodge bullets <laughs> long enough to get away from that. But the Cincinnati bullpen, I think, is a big factor because Lupinella, with Charlton back now in the bullpen, can really set things up, and I think in some ways put some pressure on Jim Leland as to when he's going to turn his lineup around, when he's going to make his changes. So it should be most interesting. Of course, as Pinella told us yesterday, if we don't score, it doesn't make any difference. We've got to score some runs. Outside, and the count goes to three and one. Davis batting with runners at first and second and a run in. You know, another thing that Lou Pinella has said about his team, he said, we're not the big red machine of the 70s. He calls it a nice little team. It's speed defense. Those are the things that work for Cincinnati, not the power that they used to have. Full count, three balls and two strikes. 
about 11,000 fans last night and not many this afternoon. I think they're all saving up maybe. Lupinella with Jackie Moore. You talked about that nice little team. For much of the 80s, people had rated the Reds the best team in the division. And they never won. And now they've won pecking away and, and not really overpowering people one wire to wire and still he gets criticized runners going the pitch is ball four and the bases are loaded all right how had him moving on three and two first walk of the ball game by Jackson and uh, the mess is full blown now bases loaded one out and Franklin stubs to the plate Not often do the runners run in front of Glenn Davis. You don't want a lot of commotion, but Art Howe playing aggressively now has the bases full with Franklin Stubbs and his 25 homers at the plate. 28-year-old Danny Jackson, lefty against lefty, and Stubbs a base hit his first time up. That'll prompt a visit to the mound by Oliver. You know, Franklin Stubbs had a pretty good season for the Dodgers last year. A knee injury in August slowed him down, but he batted 291 for the Dodgers. And Williams will go to the mound. Rather slowly, too. <laughs> Someone from Houston will be reminding him that this is the last getaway day of the season. And plate umpire Doug Harvey already going out to, uh, to say, let's go. I've got plane reservations. And it's really a tough situation as the senior umpire in all of baseball breaks up the meeting. Because for the Astros, it's been... A disappointing season. I'm not exactly sure what they expected, but I'm sure they expected to play a little bit over 500, if not contend. And you just want the season over with sometimes. And a lot of times in, in this situation, it's like one of those games in which you play your double-A affiliate. A lot of first pitch swinging, a lot of let's get it over with. While the Reds, of course, have to be focused and have to be dedicated. Fouled back. And there's no truth to the rumor that there's an automatic $25 fine for taking... <laughs> Strike one, is there? <laughs> that has happened, as John's alluding to. Sometimes when you're playing your, your A affiliate or your double A affiliate and you wonder why those games last only a minute and 21 seconds, well, there's a reason. <laughs> one and two the count. Bases loaded, a run in, and one out here. We're in the top of the third. Davis is at first. Biggio, you saw it second, and Candell is the runner at third. Fly ball, left field. Coming on is Davis. No chance for the runner to advance. Two outs. And Eric got a late jump on that ball. Actually slipped a little bit. And for a second you thought it might land, but he has such tremendous speed. Enjoys playing left field. I think he feels that it's better on his legs. He has had a lot of injuries and a lot of those from the waist down. I think he would like it and there is some talk that that shift to left could be permanent. That's why the trade of Hatcher from the Pirates has turned out to be a real plus for Cincinnati. Well they started as just a fifth outfielder and Billy has really added a lot of spark to this offense. Caminiti who grounded out his first time up takes strike one. Ken currently batting 240. Base is full but there are two outs now. A run in Houston has the lead. We're in the third in Riverfront Stadium. Bounce foul past the dugout and down toward the bullpen. And this is the type of pitcher that Jackson is when they talk about a typical bulldog. Guys in scoring position and and a lot of good pitchers will put batters in scoring position. Doc Gooden comes to my mind as first and foremost but they never seem to score. Well that's the key. That's like a pitcher who gives up a lot of home runs but when you go back and check many of those home runs were solo home runs. You don't let them stack up and have someone hit one downtown. Fergie Jenkins, Jenkins made a career out of it. One and two the count. Through the right side a base hit. That will score one. Here comes the throw to the plate. And it is in time and the inning is over. Two runs for Houston. Cut down at the plate is Craig Biggio trying to score number three. Doug Harvey rings up the third out of the inning. The Astros ring up a couple of runs. Back with the bottom of the third after this. Welcome back to ESPN's coverage of Major League Baseball on this final day of the regular season. Houston with two runs on four hits. 
in the top of the third. The Reds coming up for the bottom of the third. Along with Billy Sample, I'm John Sanders. And Billy, we've talked a bit about Cincinnati, and we've talked about their outstanding combination in the bullpen of Myers and Dibble. A lot of talk about Dibble, though. He's unhappy. He wants to be a closer. And he said, I'll be happy to continue to be the setup man if you pay me like a closer. So he's looking to his future. Well, I, I certainly can understand with that because he really makes Myers' job a lot easier. Of course, Myers has converted so well. He has a club record 31 saves. First pitch has popped up toward right field. Candell is out, gives way to Davidson. One pitch and one out here in the third. See, I told you, a lot of first pitch swinging on this last day. But more, more of that reason is because you've got a, a young guy out on the mound and, and you think he might be a little nervous, going to groove your fastball. Danny Jackson, left-handed pitcher and a right-handed batter, swinging a miss for a strike. Has a couple of hits this year, one of them a triple. Well, the upcoming National League Championship Series is being billed in some corners as the Nasty Boys, the Reds' bullpen against the Pirates' Nasty Bats. We talk about an outfield of Van Slyke, Bonilla, and Bonds, and certainly that's a great trio in your outfield. All starts here tomorrow. Right field toward the line. But with plenty of room is Davidson, and he has the first two put outs in the inning. And he's had five of the last six. Ironically, one of the concerns of Lou Pinnell is that they can't match up offensively with the Pirates, but I'm not sure if the numbers bear that out. Of course, we told you earlier that the Reds are leading the National League in batting average with a 266 average compared to the Pirates, 259, with this, which is sixth. And there are only 12 homers apart. The Reds, not a home run hitting club, but they have 125 and the Pirates 137. And the Reds lead the league in total bases, so they have some firepower as well, but they have to manufacture it a little differently than, than the Pirates. The Reds last night set a club record with doubles. They have 282 on the season, so they play that double to home baseball where the Pirates can leave the ballpark a little more readily. Well, the kind of year that Bonds has had down in that number five spot in the order, that has really made a lot of difference for the Pirates. And as you say, the Reds really can't sit wait back and let that happen of course the Pirates then also do not have the bullpen to match Cincinnati's they don't have one man as their closer it's been kind of a combination effort but even there the saves are fairly similar Cincinnati has a few more than the Pirates but uh, there are a lot of similarities statistically between the two teams a swing and a miss certainly in most circles I think Jim Leland is being touted as the National League manager of the year and that's tough to argue with and he wasn't afraid to use, of course, Landrum's the, the closer of those people, but he wasn't afraid to use guys like Palacios just coming up from the minors in the last couple of months and in crucial situations. Pitch rides inside and caught the shoulder of Larkin, who will walk slowly toward first base. He's not happy. You don't really need a bruise on the last day of the regular season with the playoffs starting tomorrow. Well, I'm sure now he'll get a chance to sit on that 302 average as this pitch runs in on his tricep. And at this time of the season, you're playing with so many bruises anyway, and you certainly don't want to accumulate any more getting ready for the biggest time of the season. Going to the second base runner for the Reds, who have been held hitless so far. They had Winningham, who bats now, reach on a walk. And the hit batsman here in this inning as Winningham fouls it away. Only the second base runner. Seven in a row had been retired by the rookie Randy Hennis. Winningham is 28 years old. Came over here from the Expos in July of 88. And enjoys it more over here than he did in Montreal though he's basically in the same type of role fouled back one and two the count but because of all the right handed pitchers the Pirates will throw against Cincinnati he should get a little more playing time at least as a pinch hitter he and Todd Benzing are coming off the bench as well and it would appear that without the availability of Bill Doran who is undergoing surgery today for his back Duncan is 
going to start every day. Great play at third by Caminetti. Guns him out at first, and that's the way the Cincinnati third inning begins. Through three, Houston has a 2-0 lead. Back to Cincinnati in just a minute. Major League Baseball brought to you by Sears, where you get your money's worth and a whole lot more. By Gallo, White Grenache. It will change the way you think about Gallo. And by Denny's. Try Denny's 10-minute guarantee and have your breakfast or lunch served in 10 minutes or it's free. Only at Denny's. Welcome back. Top half of the fourth here in Riverfront. Houston with a 2-0 lead, and Billy Sample was exactly right. Barry Larkin is finished for the afternoon after getting hit in the arm. Duncan will move over and play shortstop, and Ron Oster will be put in the leadoff spot, and he'll be playing second base. So let me get some ice early on that arm. Davidson struck out his first time up. Hits the ball toward right field, and toward the line is O'Neill, one away. Between innings, Lou Pinello went out to the mound, had a word with his pitcher and the umpire. What was that about? I'm not exactly sure what part of the body was bothering Danny Jackson or at least led Lou Pinello to think that something was wrong. And I think it's good for a former hitter to have an understanding of pitchers. You have a lot of former hitters that are managers that it takes them a while to understand pitchers and their psyche because for most of their career they're they're battling it. Big rip nothing there for Andujar Cedeno who struck out to end the second inning. Keeping a card with us, remember to put Ron Oster and Larkin's spot in the batting order, the leadoff spot. At the knees on the inside corner. Well, I tell you what, rookies don't get any break at all. Marginal calls, right? <laughs> no, that 17-inch plate is about 23 inches now. 0-2 oh the count, one out and nobody on. Well, Jackson's decided to make a living against this young man working the inside oh, part of the plate. Oh, he's going to abuse him until he can get you out of there. And and it's tough because Jackson can get inside on some strong hitters. And if you're not strong, and as you said earlier, Sedan, you're only 21 years old, so he's probably not finished growing. You can see they are keeping a close eye. Soft liner to third for out number two. A close eye on Jackson, the trainer and the pitching coach, side by side there on the dugout steps. Well, they haven't warmed anybody up. So evidently, whatever Jackson told Pinella satisfied him. This time, Cedeno gets more of the bat on the ball, but still not able to extend. Jackson breaks his bat, and Quinones makes a fine play going to his left. Two outs and nobody on, so batting for the second time as a major leaguer is Hennis. Hits this one into fair territory. Struck out his first time up, and he grounds out this time. It's a one, two, three, fourth inning. We'll go to the bottom half of the fourth in Riverfront Stadium. National League Western Division champions will send up O'Neill, Davis, and Morris. There's something elemental in us all. A basic need to seek out for ourselves a quiet place. Well, Oshkosh Men's Sportswear is made specifically for that search. Clothing that brings a man closer to himself and the earth. Rugged, comfortable, enduring. Find yourself in Oshkosh, exclusively at Sears. We are getting set for the bottom half of the fourth inning in Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati, Ohio. The Queen City set to host the National League Championship Series beginning tomorrow. A 2-0 Houston lead. No hits so far for the Reds. And, of course, baseball continues tonight on ESPN with the, the two games involving Boston and Toronto. And if it ends in a tie, should Boston lose and Toronto win tonight, be with us tomorrow, 4 o'clock, for the American League Eastern Division playoff, if necessary. And, of course, tonight at 7.30, Toronto and Baltimore, along with updates of Chicago and Boston all evening long. O'Neill takes a called strike, and it's 1-1. One and one. What are your observations about Randy Hennis so far, young man making his first start? Well, they've got a spot for him. Uh, it's only one start, and he'll have to look good in spring, but... The Astros have their four starters, first four starters set, Scott, Darwin, Deshays, and Portugal. Last night they threw Xavier Hernandez vying for that fifth starter. Swing and a miss. Count evens at two balls and two strikes. Well, so far, Hennis has not given up a hit in the major leagues. Pitched six and two-thirds innings. Lou Pinella asking him how tough it was to lead wire to wire only team in National League history to do that for 162 games he said it was very difficult on this team 
Ground ball to second base. Neal is out number one. I think they won it in April and May because since the All Star break, they've played right around 500. But they got off to such a good start and they just kept that momentum. And of course, with that bullpen with Charlton and Myers and Dibble. I think that really helped when they got off to those early leads and the Reds are good at scoring early runs and maintaining that lead and when you have that kind of pin well you're going to win some games. Davis fly to right his first time up and the Astros feel they helped contribute a little bit to that they lost a couple of <laughs> extra inning ball games early in the season to Cincinnati and helped the Reds get off to that fast start. You can go back to June the 4th Cincinnati was 33 and 12. From that point on you're right they're an exact 500 team. 0 oh and 2 now. That's why they always say, Billy, those games in April count the same as the ones in September. If you win them then, you don't need to win so many. That's in true, and I really think that's uh, that's an understated part of the game. A lot of people feel that you always win those in September. The Reds need Eric Davis to get hot. Certainly, he has the ability to be the kind of player that can carry you in postseason, in the playoffs, and in a short series. Two balls, two strikes now. And Hen is not afraid to come inside to him the last three pitches inside. A lot of pe people will pitch Eric inside. His hands are low. It takes a strong man to bring him up. Count remains two balls and two strikes. And coming into the ball game, Davis was warming up nicely for postseason. Uh, his September showed numbers of 347, seven homers, and 24 runs batted in. That's a good, solid September. Well, I think he's a candidate to be one of those 300 300 people grounded the first backhanded by Davis flips it on to his pitcher Hennis covering two away in the fourth inning still no hits for Cincinnati that is 300 homers and 300 stolen bases while attaining 2000 hits what Andre Dawson did this year he and Willie Mays the only two players to achieve those feats because he had the 30 50 earlier before Bonds did this year. 30 homers and 50 stolen bases. Hats off to both the Reds and the Pirates for making it to the National League Championship Series. We certainly at ESPN wish both of them the best. Called strike. One and one the count. Morris fly to right his first time up. Only two base runners for the Reds have been Larkin, who was hit by a pitch in the third, and Winningham, who was walked in the first. Now it's one and two. A two hopper to the shortstop Cedeno and a one, two, three, fourth inning. It's two nothing Houston after four. We'll be back with the top of the fifth in just a minute. Two nothing. Heading toward the middle part of this ball game, the Astros have the lead. I'm John Sanders, along with Billy Sample, and we're delighted to have you with us on this final day of the 1990 regular season. Time to rack the bats for Houston and head home. Put them up till springtime. Called strike one to Eric Yelding. He's leading off for the second time. One for two today, an average of 2.55. Eric is three for 11 in the series. Where would you play him? been the discussion where is Yelding going to play outfield or infield if you're not going to keep young Gerald Young I think you play him in the outfield it's an awful lot of ground to cover especially in the Astrodome even more ground there than here he's going to be your catalyst you got a lead off batter you have a guy with speed he's going to steal anywhere from 40 to 70 bases you know, the Astros had a great record at home as they always do 49 and 32 and the fact that they could only win 25 games on the road coming in today is just killed them. They've had 15 straight winning seasons at home. If you go back to 86 when they were in the division playoffs only five of those players are still around so the Astros have turned it over in the last five years and one of those players now on the Reds staff and that's Billy Hatcher. Of course, Hatcher also with the connection to Pittsburgh because he went Houston, Pittsburgh, and then Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. In the space of just a couple of months, baseball season-wise, <laughs> a little longer than that calendar-wise, but 
He wasn't around either place very long. At least not in Pittsburgh before coming to Cincinnati. That's worked out well for everybody because definitely in Pittsburgh he was probably a fifth outfielder with R.J. Reynolds. But with Art Howe's team a year ago traded in Glenn Wilson deal. Now Glenn is out for the year and who knows if he'll be back. Yelding hits it toward right center field. No problem for Winningham. One out. Speaking of Hatcher, that dramatic home run he hit in the 86 League Championship Series against the Mets in Game Six in extra innings, the Mets still coming back to win that and to go on and win the World Series. One out and nobody on. We're in the top of the fifth inning. Casey Candell is the batter. He hits a two hopper toward short. Duncan, who's playing there now, throws him out. Two up and two down. Five in a row retired now by Danny Jackson since he gave up four hits and a couple of runs in the third inning. And Duncan got caught a little bit in between, started to come in, and then had to back up and jump a little bit. But he was still able to come down and throw out a speedy Candell. Craig Biggio, who has one of the two Houston runs batted in, the other belonging to Caminiti. Biggio's average of 276 for the season. Mentioned his average. He's among those who qualify with enough at bats. Uh, Casey Candell has a higher average, but I had mentioned of regulars, he has the highest, or rather the lowest team leading average in the league. As Kip Gross, a right hander, starts to loosen up. And another reason that Biggio would want to play behind the plate outside of the fact that he desires to be behind the dish is because with the 276 average as a catcher, you can make considerable more money than you could as an outfielder. The stats look a little different when you stack them up against the Bonzes and Bonillas and those people <laughs> yeah, when you're two, an outfielder, right? 276, you're in the second <laughs> tier somewhere. You're not even making uh, the median. Uh, but as a catcher, those are those might be the best numbers around. Well, especially if you toss in his stolen base total, 25 this year. Two outs, nobody on. Houston leading 2 nothing. We're almost at the midpoint of this afternoon's season finale. Another two hopper. Another out at first, one, two, three, a fly ball and a couple of ground outs to short. We'll go to the bottom half of the fifth for Quinones, Duncan, and Oliver in a minute. Wednesday night, the pennant chase reaches the end of the line with the AL East crown up for grabs. The Red Sox beat the White Sox, or the Blue Jays face the Orioles. Wednesday night at 7.30 Eastern, live on ESPN. In Pittsburgh, the game has begun between the Mets and the Pirates, a meaningless game in the standings, but meaningful for the two guys on the mound. Frank Viola goes for win number 20 for the Mets this afternoon. He is 19-12, and 12, and Jerry Royce makes his first start of the season for the Pirates and the last start of his career. It's scoreless in the first inning in Pittsburgh. Back to Cincinnati. Thank you very much Bill and move over Billy because uh, Jerry says he wants to be a broadcaster now do nothing we're midway through this one this afternoon in Riverfront everybody <laughs> found, wants to be a broadcaster. I found out in the three years that I've worked this profession that by no means am I in his way <laughs> outside to Luis Quinones who leads off Two nothing two runs six hits. Red still looking for their first hit and it will not come here. Another put out in right field. The Reds may not care that much whether or not they win but I don't think they'd really want to go into a <laughs> league championship series <laughs> coming off a no no. That is the sixth put out in right field for Davidson. He has been the busiest player on the field. Mariano Duncan flight out that way his first time up. What a great year for Duncan. Quadruple double with 22 doubles, 11 triples. He leads the league. 10 homers, 13 stolen bases, and one nasty stare toward the mound. <laughs> I think when Mariano was with the Dodgers and uh, and Hennis was pitching at UCLA, he must have asked him for an autograph, and Mariano <laughs> didn't didn't oblige. Look at this pitch. Last night we saw a knockdown pitch dibble through one at Eric Yelding one of those that you talk about from years ago where it goes between your helmet and your head it was a serious knockdown pitch wound up in being a strike because he <laughs> caught the bat behind his helmet. <laughs> yeah. 
It was an attention getter, I guarantee you that. One and one the count here with one out and nobody on. Only two base runners in the ball game for Cincinnati. A walk and a hit batsman. They have not had a hit this afternoon. Duncan, who's hitting about 317 since the All-Star break. But in fairness to Hennis, a lot of people, right-handers especially, will try to pitch Duncan inside, thinking he doesn't have the quickness and the strength to get you out of there, especially if you have some run in on his hands. Of course, the Reds are hoping that Mariano Duncan's fine season continues as he hesitates and takes strike two, because he's going to have to play every day in the playoffs without Dorn. They had been uh, platooning them a bit. Well, for the last month, but the way they talk about Billy Dorn, you would have thought he was here all year. He was only here since August 31st. In the air, guess where? <laughs> right center field. Yeah, let Davidson have another one. That's seven putouts in right field. Both of them here in the fifth inning. He also had two in the third, two in the second, and one in the first. Duncan still a little upset about the previous pitch before the flyout. Doug Harvey, usually known as a hitter's umpire because he makes you throw a strike. So you know Doug might have that plane reservation about 345 too because he's <laughs> you better be swinging today. He's got that Frank Pulley strike zone today. Here's Joe Oliver, 25 years old, from Orlando, Florida. He swings at the first pitch and fouls it back. He flied out to right. Everybody on the team has flied out to right except uh, Larkin. Oster hasn't batted. Winningham and O'Neill. Curveball hangs high. One and one. You asked me for my playoff prediction. I kind of danced a little bit. What about yours? You dance so well, I'm going to look at the soles of your shoes. <laughs> Two and one is the count. Home plate a little dirty. I didn't clean it between innings. Three and one the count. Well, another pitch inside, and Doug Harvey may have to go and clean it after that pitch takes time to clean the plate. Let's go, fellas. Swing. <laughs> Two outs and nobody on. Here's the 3-1. High in the air. Yes. Right field. All three put outs by Davidson. We go to the sixth inning. The Reds looking for a run and a hit here in the final game. The world's fastest aircraft. 1909. The Signal Corps flyer. 30 miles per hour. 1932, the GB, 300 miles per hour. 1966, the SR-71 Blackbird Mach 3. Today, the DHL Worldwide Express van, faster to more countries than Federal Express, UPS, or any major express company. DHL, faster to more of the world. Welcome back to Riverfront Stadium. We're moving now to the top of the sixth inning, and the Astros, who put together four hits back in the third inning, have the game's only runs. And those hits, by the way, are the only hits in the ball game. Jackson has gone through the fourth and the fifth without allowing a base runner. And again, a pre-inning conversation at the mound as Oliver goes out. It'll be Davis, Stubbs, and Caminiti do up. We do have a new catcher. Sorry, but we want to double check that because we're going to see a lot of changes. Sutko is the catcher. Glenn Sutko, number 55. Saw him in the bullpen last night, and Glenn is now behind the plate for Oliver as the ball is hit into right field. Coming on to make the play is O'Neill. Let's go back to the studio. Here's Bill Patrick. Bill? All right, and ho, oh, high comedy in the Mets dugout. Frank Viola gets the old shaving cream treatment. Frankie V looking for number 20 on the afternoon as the Mets are taking on the Pirates and the Mets have roughed up Jerry Royce here for two runs in the top of the first. Pat Tabler singling in Darren Reed, who had led off with a double. A ground out scored the second run. 2-0 Mets over the Pirates. Back to Cincinnati. All right, Bill, and back in Cincinnati, it's 2-0. Houston has the lead. The pitch is low and away for a ball. Seven in a row now retired by Jackson. You mentioned the new catcher behind the plate. Sutko that ball hit well toward left center field near the warning track and able to make the play is Winningham 
Now, Winningham went a long way into left center, and he tracks it down off the bat of Franklin Stubbs. Stubbs one for three on the afternoon. But this is one of the things that Stubbs does well now. Looks like he, oh, his left ankle, he twists it as he finishes a swing. Winningham looking at the wall and tracking it down a couple of steps before. Full extension does Stubbs get. And that back foot as he plants it turns over a little bit. We'll see if he continues in the game. Caminiti drove in a run with a base hit in the third inning and on the play Biggio was thrown out at home plate that ended the inning. We'll keep an eye on Stubbs and whether or not he comes out for the bottom half of the sixth inning. One ball and two strikes the count and they're going to check him over a bit. As Billy said he twisted it on the swing in the batter's box. The new catcher for Cincinnati Glenn Sutko and this has got to be a special moment because it's his major league debut. He's a player who wasn't drafted until the 45th round in 1987 and here he is in the major league. And there is out number three. Three perfect innings in a row for Jackson. We'll go to the bottom of the six. Two nothing Houston. Saturday, it's a race of the year's top 10 IndyCar drivers, the Marlboro Challenge. Sunday, Al Lenser Jr. could lock up the IndyCar Championship live at the Bosch Park Plug Grand Prix. IndyCars this weekend on ESPN. Welcome back to Riverfront. Getting set for the bottom of the sixth inning. We'll have a pinch hitter here in the bottom of the sixth, and we have a lot more tonight on ESPN. It'll be the Blue Jays and the Orioles. If Toronto wins and Boston loses, against Chicago at home and we'll keep you updated on that one as well then those two Toronto and Boston would play off tomorrow at four on ESPN Hatcher steps in batting for Jackson swings at the first pitch and lifts it into center field yelding over under out number one We'll go now to the top of the order, and Ron Oster will bat for the first time in the ball game as Billy Hatcher traded from the Pirates to Cincinnati on April the 3rd. Heads back to the dugout. Still the no-hitter going with one out in the sixth inning for the rookie, Randy Hennis. He has hit a batter and walked a batter, and that has been it for Cincinnati. Here's Oster. Doesn't appear to be overpowering, but he has hit his spots. And a good enough fastball that he can come inside and keep the hitters honest. Most are a couple of walks in last night's ball game. Came on to play second base. Larkin was hit in the left arm by a pitch. Left the lineup. Duncan moved from second to shortstop. And Oster into the lineup in the leadoff spot. Broken bat, base hit. That will be a new team record for two base hits. Number 283 for Cincinnati. It is their first in the afternoon, and the Reds have a runner in scoring position. Ron Oster breaks the string after six and a third. A base hit, a broken bat, shattered his bat, and it turns into a double. Well, they kept going outside, outside, outside. This one catches the heart of the plate on the outside part of the corner, and Oster just went with it fortunate enough to find a hole down the left field line and he finds a two bagger. The batter will be Winningham. And we will have activity. Juan Augusto goes down to the bullpen. He leaves the National League in appearances and he goes down to the bullpen for Houston. Out to the mound. Bob Cluck out there and I think this is a good sign because the way this young man is pitched you want him to, to leave the game feeling confident feeling happy about the way he has pitched you don't want I wouldn't in this situation want him to be in a situation where the winning run is on base and you've got a guy like Augusto who can pitch in a situation it doesn't take him long to get up Juan has that rubber arm and he can pitch forever and it doesn't take him much to get warm and again we're telling you Doug Harvey is he's is, trying to keep it moving yeah, he? <laughs> he's saying let's go folks it's hot back here and uh, let's get the game over with. There is Augusto beginning to loosen up. 
almost completely overcast in the early part of the ball game. Started to break up a bit. It's warmer than it has been in Cincinnati. Temperature up in the 80s this afternoon. High in the air, left field line. Stubbs, who twisted that ankle, stayed in the ball game, goes toward the line to make the catch. Two outs and holding it second is Oster. Well, talking about the temperature, John, last night we were talking with Lou Pinnell, and he said something that was interesting as we take another look at Stubbs going towards the line. Doesn't appear to have any ill effects on that twisted ankle. But last night, Lou Pinnell said he had hoped that the weather would stay cool because when the weather is cool here at Riverfront, the ball doesn't carry as much. And since the Pirates have a few more bangers than the Reds, he thought that would work to the Reds' advantage. And the first two games are here in Riverfront tomorrow night and Friday afternoon. And after taking the weekend off, and Pinella's plans for the weekend, because the Steelers are playing in Three Rivers on Sunday, is to work out here in Riverfront Saturday and Sunday. And following Sunday's workout later in the day, they'll fly to Pittsburgh to get set for game three. And the Pirates uh, and the uh, Steelers' offense isn't good enough at the moment that anybody would want to go up and, and oh, might and be catch catching right <laughs> yeah. two balls and one strike O'Neill reached on the fielder's choice and grounded out he hits this one toward right field right there again is Davidson another put out and right a one out double but no damage we'll move to the seventh in Riverfront two nothing Houston. We start the seventh inning in Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati, with a new man in the center of the diamond for Cincinnati. There is Kip Gross, number 59, 26 years old, and he came to Cincinnati as part of the deal in the swap between Randy Myers and John Franco. Part of the Franco Myers trade between the Mets and the Reds. Gross' fifth appearance this year. In five and a third innings, he has given up six hits and three runs. Filed back by Mark Davidson. Davidson has been busy in right field. Nine putouts so far for him. Keith Brown is now heading toward the Cincinnati bullpen. Another right-hander. Pulls it to the left side. Duncan for out number one. Back we go to the studio and Bill Patrick. All right, John. Willie McGee of the Oakland A's is pretty much a shoe in now for the National League batting title because Dave Magadan, who came in six points behind McGee, Flew out in the first inning in his only at bat for the Mets against the Pirates. He was then replaced by Kelvin Torbin. Let's go back to Cincinnati. Thank you, Bill. And how about that? A guy in the American League wins the National League batting championship. Magan would have had to go five for five to overtake McGee. Swing and a miss by Sedeno, who is 0 for 2. He struck out and hit a soft liner to third, and he's behind here. No balls, two strikes. And here is a major league slider. And a swing where your head was there, but his <laughs> body wasn't going up the middle enough to make contact. We're located in different sections. Yes. Right. No balls, two strikes, one out. Filed away again. Again, he comes back with a breaking ball. And you better believe it'll be a long winner if he doesn't get a hit. He's been in now five games. Is that a little slider, and it's one and two. How much did you think or worry about your first major league hit when you got called up? Not so much about the hit. The at bat was I, it's hard to describe because you you haven't experienced anything like that. So there was a lot of anticipation a lot of adrenaline flowing for that first at bat and I was kind of fortunate because the first pitch I saw I swung and got a hit. Thank you very much and got it <laughs> over with it into that problem. Yes. <laughs> swing and a miss second time in the ball game. the gross is down on strikes. The first strikeout for Gross, picking it up for Jackson, who went six innings, gave up six hits and two runs. Well, if you've looked bad on one pitch, that time he turned a fastball over to Pierre, and Sedeno swinging out from under his helmet, was his head was not where the pitch was. Two outs and nobody on. Eleven Astros in a row retired now, as Eric Anthony steps in to pinch hit for Randy Hennis. This is a man who has a lot of promise. So far, he hasn't shown that ability. He's strong. His bat appears to be just a little bit slow. He's still on the interstate. And this is very late in the year. He has over 200 at-bats, the interstate being one-something, I-something, as the players will say. 
Takes that pitch outside. But he has a big swing. And for that type of swing, he's got to generate a little more bat speed. Anthony's still very, very young, and some feel in the organization not really ready for what the Astros have asked him to do. He's only 22 years old. But he struggled a bit of late. He's on a three for 14 slide. His batting average is 193. If he could get a hit, that might push him, get him off of that road <laughs> that you have him on. There. No, if you're if you're at three nah, for I guess 14, not, with, nah, not for over 200 at bats, I probably wouldn't jump no. you up enough. Yeah, if you're at three for 14, <laughs> you're actually pretty hot if you're hitting only 190 something. <laughs> He's scorching. Two outs and nobody on. Anthony pitch hitting for Hennis, who pitched very effectively in his first major league start. Six innings here. Only one hit. Didn't strike out anybody. And walked only one. That certainly was a big key and a plus for Randy Hennis. Two to nothing. Houston has the lead. Astros batting in the top of the seventh inning. No, no longer. That's it. A couple of strikeouts by Gross to end the seventh. Seventh inning stretch in Riverfront. The Reds are down a pair. For the 82nd time, that is a club record. Juan Augusto is on to pitch in relief. And his first pitch to Davis catches the outside corner for a strike. A new catcher as well as former Red Terry McGriff moves behind the plate. He'll bat in the number three spot. Augusto goes in the number nine spot. Nine wins, eight losses, and four saves, and they just run him out there, seems like, every other day. He's been in half the games. Davis takes strike two. One and two on Davis, who has flied to right and grounded out. Eric batting 259. Augusto trying to protect a 2 0 lead. Henning, the starter, goes six innings, gives up just one hit. Only three base runners. He walked a batter and hit one as well. Didn't strike out anybody. Six very good innings for the rookie, Randy Hennis. And as you say, the real decision will come in the spring, but certainly that kind of sets the table for him. They'll know who he is when he shows up. <laughs> That'll be out of play in the seats down the right field line. A lot of seats empty here, but you can bet that's going to change over the next two days. The Pirates will be here to begin the National League Championship Series tomorrow night and again Friday afternoon. And the series moves to Three Rivers on Monday. Still 2 2. And after the way Hen is through today, you know the Astros wish that they had called him up earlier so they could evaluate him a little more, but certainly he didn't hurt himself with this afternoon's performance. Augusto's appearance is 82, the most by a relief pitcher as Davis grounds at the center field. Since the had 90 in 1987, from here we go back to Bill Patrick. Bill? All right, John, let's head to the Metrodome. The Twins and the Mariners. Randy Johnson's pitch to Pedro Munoz. And in a meaningless game, watch the effort by Jay Buhner. Full out, up against the fence. Does he hold on? Well, we know he doesn't, although he thinks he does. It's a 3-3 game now. And again this year, John and Billy, the M's will not finish at 500. Thank you very much, Bill. Of course, neither will the Houston Astros. After finishing over 500 last year, they've turned it around the other way. Throw to first where Eric Davis has the second Cincinnati hit of the afternoon. A 2-0 ball game, and Hal Morris, who is flying to right and grounded out, is the batter. Lefty against lefty. In there for a strike. 0-1. Morris taking over the first base position about midway through the season from Todd Benzinger. And Morris coming into today's play at 344, now at 342. Behind here, no balls and two strikes as he swings through that one. I don't think you can understate just what it means to have a, a hitter as a manager. And you'll see Lou Pinella at times, and he'll be in the dugout totally ignoring the play working on hitting weight shift and, and keep your head there Davis is running it's strike three and a stolen base Davis lost sight of the ball for a moment because backing up the play was Candell so Eric picks up his 20th stolen base of the season so a 2020 season for him despite the injuries that he's had 
And with 24 homers and 86 runs batted in to go with it. And that's not bad when you consider the numbers he puts up for the amount of time that he plays. McGriff's first throw in the game is wide and a good play by Candell backing up. Looked like he tried to deke Davis when he was still on the turf, but Eric wasn't falling for it. Davis at second base, swing and a miss by Luis Quinones. He's popped up to first and fly to right. Nine Reds have flied out to right field in the ball game. 0 and 1 the count. And they took batting practice. That kind of surprised late. you, didn't it? Davis going for third. He's there, the ball into right field, and he will get up and score. So Davis with two stolen bases and on the throw from McGriff into left field, he scores the first Cincinnati run. You get the feeling that Eric's just trying to tune it up a little bit for tomorrow night. And that's pretty mean to do that on McGriff just coming into the game. Exploiting an advantage. He throws the ball away the first time and a little tentative on that throw, I think, Terry was. Caminiti getting to the bag. And the ball is late and wide, and Davis scores easily. Meanwhile, back to the plate. Quinones looking at a one ball, two strike count. One out and a run in. The Reds have cut the lead in half. It's two to one. And defeating Houston four to three on Monday and winning last night three to two. Two strikeouts in a row as Doug Harvey rings up Luis Quinones. Well, Agosto had been going outside, 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 and then he started that ball inside off the plate, and it ran right over the inside corner and caught Quinones looking. Mariano Duncan, who's fly to right twice, currently batting 307. He's dropped a couple of points off that average, but this is a career year for Duncan. First time he's ever hit over 300, a comebacker. That will end the inning. It is an unearned run in the bottom of the seventh. We'll go to the eighth. Houston leading Cincinnati two to one in Riverfront. ESPN Major League Baseball brought to you by Michelob Dry Beer. Once you experience the bold taste with no aftertaste, there's no going back. By Rico, a worldwide leader in copier facts and camera technology. And by UPS, fast, efficient service to more than 180 countries and territories worldwide. As we start the eighth inning, we have some changes. Houston leads on the scoreboard. That changed in the bottom of the seventh with an unearned run. You can see it on the mound. Chino Minatelli is the new pitcher. He's 26 years old. Originally from Delaware. Went to college in California. And high school in California. It's Sweetwater, California. Yelling for the third time in the leadoff spot. That's not the only change. Davis is gone from the lineup. And Benzinger is in left field. And that is he reaching down to make a nice running catch. Todd Benzinger who played about half the year at first, did a good job there last year, coming over from Boston, now moving to the outfield, and a fine play there. Certainly is your first play running in on the turf. Because if that gets by him with yielding speed, that would be a triple. First pitch is up high to Casey Candell. Casey, part of a group of Astros who enjoyed ESPN last night, watching that battle between Toronto and Chicago. Finally won in extra innings by the White Sox to set up the possibility as it continues, depending on what happens tonight, Billy, of the playoff tomorrow. A little over 10,000 on hand here today, but Riverfront will be rocking and rolling tomorrow and Friday. And talking about that matchup tonight, the Boston hosting Chicago matchup, it's not going to be easy for the Red Sox because Alex Fernandez is on the mound for the White Sox and he throws well called up during this season. He gets the ball up there in a hurry. They were comparing him to some of the fine right handers in the league. A young Tom Seaver among them. The count here is three balls and two strikes. Good running catch coming toward the line by Benzinger. This time he goes back the other way. Much easier play. 
two put outs by the new left fielder Todd Benzinger Handel is retired in that game tonight Fernandez will face Mike Bodiger going for the Red Sox as they hope to clinch Lupinella says this is his most satisfying year in baseball he says the job for a manager is certainly much tougher than for a player what he was saying is that he's responsible for everything it really takes everything he has because he has to make sure that everybody on the ball club is in sync and doing what they need to do so he said by far this is his most satisfying year in baseball and when you think of it here is a longtime American leader coming to the National League not knowing anybody and doing such a terrific job hit high toward right short of the warning track Winningham makes the catch to retire McGriff three fly ball outs here in the top of the eighth bottom of the eighth is next in Riverfront Stadium Cincinnati it'll be a lot of fun tonight because the Jays are playing in Baltimore we'll have that game at 730 Eastern time here on ESPN also keep you posted on the White Sox and the Red Sox and should Toronto win and Boston lose that will set it up for tomorrow on ESPN four o'clock for a potential playoff game between the Red Sox and the Blue Jays in Toronto Augusto on the mound again as we begin the bottom half of the eighth inning the batter is Sutko who came on to catch Glenn Sutko's first time at bat in the major leagues and a guy who was drafted in the 45th round gets up gets his opportunity to play and this is everybody's dream you know he was drafted even lower than I was I didn't realize they had that many rounds <laughs> what round were you drafted 28th out of high school and 10th out of my junior year in college. Well, see, so going to college paid off, and you moved up 15 notches, and no doubt got a much larger check, I'm sure. Yeah, those 10th round picks really demand a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> One and two, the count. Augusto gave up an unearned run in the seventh inning. Swing and a miss, and the first major league at bat for Sutko results in a strikeout. A tough guy to face. For your first at bat because his pitches have so much movement. One of the few sliders that was thrown, and Sutko swings over top of it. We do have a new second baseman as well as we have a new pinch hitter for Cincinnati. Sabo bats for the first time in the ball game, coming on to pinch hit for the pitcher. Sabo's average at 270. Minatelli kept it going because 15 Astro batters have been retired in a row as he works a perfect inning. Gross did as well. Sabo takes the pitch inside. One ball and one strike. We have Tim Burtzis warming up for Cincinnati. See, it just shows the managers never tell you the truth because Lou told us unequivocally last night that Leana would pitch. He knew we would take the bait. <laughs> Abo's average at 270. Career high, 25 home runs. Hits this one high and deep to left, but it's turning well foul. It was off the facade near the upper deck. What Lou Pinella did say last night was that Myers and Dibble would not pitch today. He wants to give them an extra day's rest before tomorrow's beginning of the championship series. Line drive toward left field and over quickly is Stubbs to make the catch. So Sabo hit it right on the button and he is the second out in the eighth inning. And I've heard some people talk about Stubbs range in left field so far what we've seen the last two days he's played it well covered a lot of ground. We do have a new second baseman I don't know if we mentioned that or not but Rody is now playing second base Dave Rody number six is at second base brought up in the middle of June from Tucson. Batter here is Oster. Doubled in the sixth inning. One of only two Cincinnati hits in the ball game. And offensively, I'm sure, Billy, this is not what Lou Pinella had in mind for the eve of the playoffs. No, he ran his starters out there, and they've played all except Larkin, who left after getting hit. Oster's going to be looking for his second double of the afternoon. Here comes the throw, head first, and safe to second base. A two-out double by Oster. He is two for two, both doubles. Both going to the opposite field. Going down the left field line as a left-handed batter and down the right field line 
as a right-handed batter, and that man has been busy today. In addition to the nine putouts, he had to track down this double down the right field line. And again, Oster using that inside-out swing. Looked like that was what he was trying to do, shove it down that line. We'll have a pinch hitter now for Herm Winningham, and it'll be Glenn Braggs. And Lou Pinella has announced that Braggs and O'Neill will platoon in right field. Braggs, of course, playing against the left-handed starter. Right now, Zane Smith, I believe, is the third starting or starter for game three of that league championship series. So that would be Braggs' start. 27-year-old Glenn Braggs batting 299 with six homers and 28 runs batted in. It was June the 9th of this summer that he was traded from Milwaukee where he had been batting 248. And Art Howe goes to the mound. Talk to Juan Augusto. It might be Artie's last trip to the center of the diamond this summer. Who knows? As he makes that trip, Dave Smith makes a trip to the pins. Dave Smith's got a shot at his 200th save, and they will go to him if need be. Currently number 10 on the all-time saves list. Braggs, the pinch hitter for Winningham. The tying run at second base. We're in the bottom of the eighth inning. Only three hits for Cincinnati. It's a two to one, a Houston lead. The called strike one to Braggs. I mean, you look at what the Astros have done. I think they average of home 3.6 runs and on the road 3.4. So there's not a great deal of difference, but you can see how much the dome helps them and their pitching staff at home. A great home record and only 25 wins for the entire season on the road. One and one. It may be that psychological, just a matter of confidence, because a lot of hitters have trouble going into the dome. They feel as though they're hitting in, in a tunnel, and it's tough picking up the ball. And possibly the Astros pitchers use that to their advantage. A two-out double has Ulster at second base. It's one and two now on Bragg, so he got that breaking ball down and in. You know, I think that certainly used to be the case in Houston, although they've improved the place so much aesthetically the last couple of years that it appears to me at least and I don't play there but it seems like the feeling would be better than it used to be it used to really be dark and kind of dingy but they've made a lot of changes Reds fans want to get something going down a run here in the eighth inning and missed by much it's 2 2 well you see Jerry Glanville had all that black from uh, <laughs> from wearing his outfit as we see just how little Agosto misses the knees on the inside corner. 2-2 two -two the count with Oster at second and two outs. Juan Agosto trying to protect a 2-1 Houston lead. It's the bottom of the eighth in Riverfront. That one hit him. So the runner who had taken off for third will have to come back. Augusto hits Braggs and Paul O'Neill will bat. And I guess if you're Augusto, why not to get him to chase a sharp breaking ball as Art Howe looks on? Because you got a left handed batter coming up. First base was open. And you're ahead of the count. You didn't want to hit him, but That's you true. certainly want, wanted to establish that part of the plate so you could go back outside. And Augusto has so much movement on his pitches that that outside part really expands. One ball to count on O'Neill. O'Neill, a base hit his last time. Excuse me. He reached on a fielder's choice in the first inning, so he's 0 for 3 today. Augusto gave up an unearned run in the seventh. The tying and go ahead runs are on here in the eighth inning. It's inside to O'Neill, who some feel could be one of the keys to the upcoming playoffs with the Pirates starting tomorrow. Well, those left-handed hitters are going to have to keep Jim Leland from pitching strong right-handers. They've got Walk and Drabeck starting the first two games, so you're going to need some good output from O'Neill. Ground ball right side off the glove of Davis into right field. A run scores, and it's a 2-2 ball game. Oster checks in, and on the play, Braggs goes all the way to third. It is ruled a hit off the glove of the first baseman Davis who could not come up with it. 
Give the RBI to O'Neill, his 78. Braggs winds up at third, and it's 2-2. And Dave Smith will lose his save situation unless the Astros go up. O'Neill finds a hole between first and second. And because Davis tips the ball, it allows the ball to go in the right field where Davison doesn't have a play on it. Possibly Candell had a play on it behind Davis. Could have kept the ball in the infield and kept the runner from scoring. Well, it was not Artie's last trip to the mound. He's going to go and into that bullpen and bring in Smith, even though, as you mentioned, the save opportunity for Dave is gone. Well, Art Howe playing this game like he should, like he wants to win it. Want to leave with a good feeling going into the 1991 season. As we said earlier, Dave Smith would much rather be in a save situation. A closer would always want to be in a save situation. And not too many of them are crazy about coming in in tied situations, but that's the, the job that Smith will be faced with here in the eighth. Augusto giving up the two runs. The first one was unearned. This one he dug himself a bit of a hole, had two outs, gave up the opposite field double to Oster, hit Braggs on O'Neill with a base hit off the glove of the first baseman, Davis. I think that's kind of symbolic of what's happened to Houston all year long, Billy. It started that way. You alluded to it earlier how the Reds got started by beating the Astros in a couple of extra inning games early in the season. And that was one of the things that the Astros did so well the previous year playing well in extra innings. They've played 27 extra inning games this season. That's but, more than anybody else. But that might have been an omen the way the season started. And it appears that it could be finishing up this way. 23 saves for Dave Smith. The only thing he can do here today is possibly even his record at six and six. Smith a sinker curveball pitcher. He'll throw a big curve now to start a lot of hitters off. Sometimes as relief pitchers have been around the league for a while, they'll change their repertoire a little bit. Usually the power pitchers will. Guys like Lee Smith, and I remember Goose Gotch is late in his career, instead of throwing you to good fastball, would start some of the tougher hitters off with sliders. But now Smith sometimes will let a big breaking curveball as well as the sinker. We're in Cincinnati, but coming up later tonight, our cameras will be in Baltimore. The Blue Jays and the Orioles will also keep you posted, updated with highlights from Fenway Park in Boston, the White Sox and the Red Sox. If Boston loses, Toronto wins. They'll go tomorrow at 4 o'clock live here on ESPN. Strike one to Benzinger on the breaking pitch as Lou Pinella has seen his team claw back to get even in this ballgame. It's 2-2. Braggs is at third. O'Neill at first. O'Neill with the run batted in. Little number foul to the right of home plate. And Todd Benzinger behind in the count, no balls and two strikes. A 2.53 average for Todd, five homers and 46 runs batted in. Smith, one of those free agents that the Astros are trying to figure out about the future. Breaking ball low. Benzinger is 27, came over from Boston in December of 88. Had a 245 with 17 homers a year ago. Missed only one game all of last year. That was uh, the last part of April he missed a game. Hit well toward left field. Stubbs is there to track it down. We have played eight in Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati on the final day of the 1990 season. Final out to Smith, 2-2, we go to the ninth. Budweiser storyline some outstanding pitching by Hennis in his first major league start had a no hitter through six and a third gave up just one hit in six innings rather five and a third one hit in six innings strong performance by Danny Jackson he gave up a couple of runs early Biggio with an RBI on O'Neill with the base hit off the glove of Davis to tie the game in the eighth and along with Billy Sample I'm John Sanders Tim Burtzis is the new pitcher and we are tied in the ninth inning I guess that's not unusual because there have been 27 extra inning games already for Houston Burtzis is one and two with no saves and a three seven five ERA and the Astros as we have documented have not scored a lot of runs throughout the season and the Reds of late struggling to score runs 
And we talked about it earlier. Lou Pinello would like to see the Reds score a few more runs, have a little more offensive momentum going into the playoffs. The Reds have not had a base runner since they scored the two runs in the third inning. That inning ended when Biggio was thrown out at home plate. The last 15 Astros have been retired. Glenn Davis is 0 for 2. He walked in that third inning. He's flied out twice. 29th appearance for the left-hander Burtzis. Burtzis throws that proverbial heavy ball. When he's on his game, it's one of those pitches that you never feel as though you get through it well, get through the strike zone. Has a little more resistance as it meets your bat. Why is that? What does he do that that makes the hitter feel that way? The only thing I knew about hitting <laughs> or pitching is that it's tough to hit. But I <laughs> it could be uh, just your makeup. It could be the way you turn the ball over. Just foul outside of first, and you could see Morris at first, and Quinones with an earlier shot there at third, definitely guarding the lines here in the ninth inning. Smith and Burtzis are the pitchers of record. Jackson started for Cincinnati, went six, then Gross, Minatelli, and now Burtzis. It's been Hennis, Augusto, and now Smith for Houston. Two balls and a strike on Davis. Three and one. Three balls, one strike. Another guy that throws that heavy ball that some of the viewers may see tonight is a guy like Jim Acker with the Blue Jays. Throws that heavy ball. Dennis Lamp throws a heavy ball. Three and two. Open his eyes where those right hand hitters like it, but he couldn't catch up. And to go along with that same theory, guys who throw that heavy ball don't give up many home runs. Three balls, two strikes. Top of the ninth inning. 2 2 in Riverfront Stadium. Off the railing. Out past Dutch Renner, who, along with the umpire at second base, Jerry Crawford, will be here tomorrow night as part of the National League umpiring crew. And they probably didn't bring enough change of clothes. <laughs> Maybe they did. Maybe they knew well before it was announced, you suppose? High in the air, out of play down the right field line. Back in a crowd of just over 10,000 this afternoon. For Dutch Renard, it'll be his sixth National League Championship Series. For Jerry Crawford, it will be his fourth. Well, some people have accused Richie Phillips, the umpires union head, of having a lot of influence and pull, so maybe they did know they were going to umpire the LCS. Again, fouled back. Straight behind home plate, what you think would normally be our broadcast position, but they're kind of set up for the playoffs here. And we're in another county, so to speak. <laughs> down the right field line. It's a different view from this angle, I'll tell you that. I'm glad you're doing the play-by-play, -play, because I'd say fly ball to left, and Braggs would catch it in right. Go ahead, run aboard. Davis works a walk from Burtzis. Franklin Stubbs, the batter. See, the preparations are definitely in place. They haven't turned on the cameras yet in the blimp but it is getting positioned for the playoffs that begin tomorrow night here in Cincinnati we'll have a pinch runner for Davis well, that will wind up Glenn's 1990 season as Young takes over And he'll be curious to see whether or not he will be stealing with Stubbs at the plate. Want to keep that hole for him. You made the comment earlier as the bullpen continues. That's Keith Brown, the right-hander. But Art Howe is managing like it was the middle of the season. Trying to do what he can to win the final game of 1990. Too high. It was Young who set the club record. 88 with stolen bases for Houston with 65. 
Yelding was 64 this year. Eric has been on base one time today. Came around to score one of the two runs in the third inning. By the way, the base on balls to Davis. As Young takes over for him at first. Ends that string of 15 Astros in a row retired by a combination of Jackson, Gross, and Minatelli. Eric Gregg is the first base umpire standing behind Morris and Young. As Burt's a snap throw over and no tag applied. The count is one ball on the batter. Franklin Stubbs. Well, Burt's is going to make Young earn it if he's going to steal because Tim has slowed to the plate. That time he quickened it up a little bit. Behind second base. Duncan squeezes out number one in the ninth. Stubbs pops up. Franklin one for four for the afternoon. Ken Caminiti will come to the plate. He got a base hit to drive in a run in the third. And on that same play, Biggio was thrown out trying to score the third run, and that ended the inning. And until this inning, that's been it for Houston. They did have hits in the first and second. Put together four hits in the third. They have six for the ball game. The Reds have only four. It's a 2-2 score. We're in the ninth. Along with Billy Sample, I'm John Sanders. And very happy to have you with us on this final day of the 1990 regular season. Sliced foul out of play, and we invite you to be here at 7:30 tonight. When the American League East could be settled. And then again, you might have to be back tomorrow. We'll have live coverage from Baltimore, the Blue Jays, and the Orioles, and also have updates. It's Lou Pinella doesn't have to worry about all that kind of stuff. Wire to wire for Cincinnati. Trying to match the victory total the Reds had in 78. The 91 wins for Cincinnati. The most they've had since they won 92 and 78. And that wire to wire, the first team to do that since the 84 Tigers who won 35 out of their first 40 and I saw six of those up, up close, close and personal <laughs> one and one the count one out and one on in for a strike one and two Steve against McDonald in that game in Baltimore see how big Ben does against the Blue Jays tonight at 730 on ESPN the league's hitting under 200 against Ben McDonald. Only Nolan Ryan has the league hitting under 200 in the American League. I got to see Nolan pitch a couple of times this summer in my trips to Texas. What an amazing, amazing man. I think he's scarier now. I got to face him late 70s when he threw the 98 to 100 mile an hour fastball and the big curveball. Now he throws a cut fastball and a changeup and, and still rushes it up there about 95 miles an hour. You get your attention. 2 2 the count. Now it's full at 3 and 2. They throw behind a Young at first, but he's back safely. Sutko, the rookie, working behind the plate. And Sutko with a good idea. And if this throw is on the right hand side, then Morris has a chance. And Young. Two steps on the carpet. He got his heart pumping a little faster anyway, didn't it? Full count, three and two. Burgess has already walked one in the inning. There's one out. There's a fly ball to center field. Back is O'Neill near the warning track to the wall. The ball is against the wall. A run will score on the play. Caminetti is around second on his way to third as the ball comes back into the infield. The Astros go back on top, three to two. Caminetti gets his second run batted in, a triple over the head of center fielder Paul O'Neill. So Art Howe up. Pinella sitting down. His team is down by a run three to two. Possibly O'Neill could have caught this ball. But he doesn't normally play center field and two there's no sense in him having to peel himself off the center field wall a day before the playoffs out over the plate. Caminiti with a good swing. O'Neill back. I think he jumps just before. Yes, he gives it away. He's about a step away. Yeah, he's looking for some cover. <laughs> yeah, he shies away a little bit. 
course, the ball in center field, you got to worry about the spin both ways. And you're used to stationing yourself in right or left. You pretty much know what it's going to do. No, I think he was protecting himself <laughs> for his start tomorrow night. A triple, a run batted in for Caminiti, who's driven in two of the three. Check swing, but a called strike. Davidson this afternoon is 0 for 3. He's behind here, no balls, two strikes. So the walk comes back to haunt Tim Burtzis. Only the second of the game allowed by Reds pitchers. Jackson also walked a batter. One and two, the count. Houston leading by a run. Caminiti with a triple off the center field fence. Scoring Young, who was pinch running for Glenn Davis. Called strike three. Davidson caught looking on a ball on the inside part of the plate. Burtzis gets the strikeout. There are two gone. And pretty good pitch selection by Setko, the catcher, the young catcher. Because Davidson has a swing where he really likes to extend, and it takes longer to extend on that inside pitch. You don't have quite as much time as you would on a pitch away. Still looking for hit number one, 0 for 7 in the major leagues is Cedeno. He struck out twice today. Grounds it off the body of Quinones, stays with it, whips it to first in time to end the inning. A run for the Astros. Houston comes up for their. Cincinnati comes up for its final at bat in the regular season with Morris, Quinones, and Duncan down by a run. Nothing's rougher on a man's face than shaving. That's why there's Skin Bracer. It's more than an aftershave. It soothes, cools, tightens pores, so it's good for your skin. Thanks. I needed that. Skin Bracer aftershave. By minute. Getting set for the bottom of the ninth inning. The Astros coming up with a run in the top of the ninth to lead three to two. We have some changes. Young, who pinch ran and scored the run, stays in the ballgame. He'll play center field. Yelding, who was in center field, moves to right field. And Sims comes on to play first base. So those are the changes for the Houston Astros. And it is slapped foul by Hal Morris. Morris, Quinones, and Duncan do up. And Rafael Ramirez checks in at shortstop for the Astros as well. Again, fouled away. And again, you have to wonder just how concerned, as you look at Yelding, who went from center to left, Lou Pinella will be because of the lack of offense today. Ramirez from behind second base throwing out how Morris one away. Well he made it very strong his statement last night that he feels good about his team. But he wants more runs more offense. He certainly hasn't gotten it today only four hits and two runs. One of those basically manufactured on the legs of Davis. And at least on paper. Going against the heart of an order of Van Slyke Bonds and Bonilla. And if they're on their game, and then you throw in a Sid Bream and some of the table setters in front of him and a lean hitting well from the bottom of the order, they could be in some trouble. Well, of course, Backman has had a lot to do with the Pirates' success this year, and the return certainly of Sid Bream, having Mike LeBallier healthy and around all year. Swing and a miss by Quinones. And there are two gone in the bottom of the ninth inning. And Smith, who usually throws the sinker, really has some bite on this one. That's the super sinker. He and Agosto must get together before they throw that one. Both have that kind of downward motion, almost an illusion. Duncan is 0 for 3. He homered in the first game of this series. To reach double figures in that category, it's no balls, one strike. Smith looking for his sixth win of the year. Doug Harvey chase somebody here or what? It appears to be pitching coach Bob Cluck. And what could he be <laughs> upset about? <laughs> He's got two outs. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. He had an overload. One out away from the season. <laughs> the 
That is exactly the situation. The regular season is one out away from being history. And home plate umpire Doug Harvey, the crew chief to the end, tosses the pitching coach off the bench. <laughs> I don't know what the nature of that discussion was about, but it a, seems to be a slight smile on Art's face, though. <laughs> Phil Garner to his right. The bench coach. Hopped up toward the dugout. In about the third row. You get the feeling that's one of those tosses that Doug Harvey won't even send in. Won't even make him pay a fine for that one. One and two. Dave Smith could be one out away from Houston's 26th road win of the year. And there it is. The called strike, a couple of strikeouts in the inning. The Reds go in order. Only four hits in the ball game as Art Howe and the Astros wave goodbye to the 1990 season. And Cincinnati's now got to get it up. Pittsburgh will be here tomorrow. Well, they certainly do. Uh, as we said a few times during the telecast, they've got to generate some offense. The feeling is, as we said earlier, that Lou Pinella knows his staff has to score four more, uh, four runs or more his his offense, and they've done that in the games that they've beaten the Pirates. But in the games in which they have not scored four runs or more, they have lost. And they split the 12 games that they had played this season. For Billy Sample, I'm John Sanders in Riverfront Stadium. The final again, the Astros win the last game of the regular season, 3-2 over the Reds. It's the Reds and the Pirates tomorrow. And our thanks and goodbye from Cincinnati. All right, John and Billy, thank you very much. Good job. And